Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ivan, and uh, I'm a quant at a trading firm called Susquehanna in Dublin, Ireland. And I'm actually surprised to see so many people here, given that there is a competing, competing talk on Scythe and Gunnar right now in the main room. Um, so thanks, thanks for coming. And today I'd like to talk about C++, which may seem like a weird choice of topic for a Python conference, but I think it's pretty relevant and interesting And in that there's been a few good talks this week on CPython and CFFI and uh, on PyPy. So I think it fits, it fits in quite nicely and I hope you'll enjoy it. So let's talk about uh, Python extensions. So what exactly is a Python extension model? And by Python, we <coughs> I really mean CPython here. This Python extension model is something that you can import from Python, but it's not written in Python. And that normally means it's written on C or C++ because CPython provides a um, C API. But these days you can also write extension modules in uh, other languages like Rust or Go. Uh, so why would you why would you do that? Um, and the the first the, like the main reason um, usually is to to be able to interface with other libraries. So maybe you want to use some part of TensorFlow um, that's not that's not been wrapped in Python yet. So you can do it this way, or you can maybe you write uh, your code in C++ and you want to interface with that. Um, another thing is pretty common reason is writing the performance critical code, so numeric code, that does number crunching very fast and then you can expose it to Python. And the two less obvious reasons um, that are really important, that I found really important in uh, my own work uh, are these. Uh, so if you, if you have non-Python libraries, like written in C++, uh, for example, you can mirror the API in Python um, literally one-to-one. -one. And this lets you prototype things very fast, like in Jupyter Notebook, uh, for example. And then you can just translate it back to C++, just add the semicolons, basically, and change the for loop syntax. And if you do that, you can also run the test in Python. It's not that you can't do that in C++, it's just it's a lot easier. There's like very nice test frameworks. And if you're testing numeric code, it's very nice to be able to use NumPy and Pandas and all the other tools. And it, the last two points actually play well together, like you can, trans you can start prototyping things and then write tests in Python and then translate things back to C++, but your tests just stay the same, so, which you know, confirms that you did it right. Um, so it's possible to write uh, Python ex uh, extensions in uh, pure C, and there's been quite a few talks on this as well. But if you go in this way, you need to have a few skills, like you have to be good at ref counting and um, I don't think anyone's good at ref counting if your name is not Larry Hastings. And um, there's exception handling that you have to do manually. Uh, and by that, I really mean like C-style error handling. You have, to, you have to be able to type fast and have a good keyboard because you, you'll type a lot and you'll make some errors. And if you, if you don't make some errors, then there'll be the Python core devs will change the API and make them for you. So that's, that's quite a lot of pain to go through. Um, so here's an idea. Let's, um, if we can translate Python into Python C API calls, why don't we, instead of running that, why don't we just translate it back to C? And then we can augment Python with this fancy new syntax so that we get like fun pointers and references and all that. And it, it kind of works, and, and there's libraries that use that heavily, like uh, scikit-learn and pandas, um, like the most numeric intensive routines are actually written in Python. But there's a few problems with that as well. So first, you're not writing C and you're not writing Python, and, and it's actually, at times, it's really hard to figure what is it you're writing. And a, as I've just checked a few days back, a two-line site module generates 2,000 lines of C, so it's, it's quite a lot. Uh, you have multiple build steps, the IDs usually choke on that. It has limited C++ support, so it's like, it's like stuck in 2003. It has a few new features supported, but most of them are not. Um, and it's has limited support for metaprogram and generic types. You have to create stubs for everything that you, you use from C. And so I think it's good for wrapping a few functions, again, like, kind of like Pandas does it. It's not so good for managing huge code base. But my biggest gripe really is this. It, this is debugging compiled site and extensions. It's just complete pain. And I just want to illustrate that real quick. So here we have a function that does uh, nothing, but it does this nothing n times. Right, so um, I'm pretty sure if you pass it to PyPy, it would just not generate any code at all. Um, so if we run Scython on that, then um, nothing good happens. 
So this is the code for just one line, like for i in range of n, where we told Cython that n is an integer, so like what could i be? And so you, you would expect like a C4 loop. And I'm not gonna zoom this in, there's nothing um, interesting in there, it's just a bunch of Cython C calls really. And so what, what's, what's wrong? Turns out that I forgot to tell Cython that it's i is an integer, for some reason I had to do that. Um, and then it generates, it's still not nothing, it's something and it's, it looks pretty bad. So if you were to, but you, you can actually see the for loop. But if you were to debug this in like step through it in GDB, it would be just a complete pain. Um, so here's another idea. Let's use Boost. And Boost is just a humongous uh, C++ library that does everything. So if, you know, if, if uh, C++ could make coffee, that would be Boost coffee library for it. Um, and there's a Boost Python written by Dave Abrahams, who is the, also the author of Boost uh, MPL metaprogramming library. And the problem with that is that you have to build it. And depending on your platform, that may or may not be easy. It requires, it also requires Boost, which is, the last time I checked it was a million and a half lines of headers. Um, and it uses weird tools for building, and then it requires on this, because Boost is compatible with everything, like in all old compilers, it doesn't use the new language features, so it uses its own like metaprogramming library. So it's, it takes a very long time to compile, and you end up with huge binaries, and it doesn't attract new contributors because it's really hard. Actually, you have to know the entire boost to do anything with it. And just a disclaimer: this is not this is not a talk on like Bash and Scythe and Boost. They're they're both really good uh, options. If like if you're already using Boost, then Boost Python may be like a really good choice. Or Scythe is a really good choice if you're just wrapping a few a few functions. Um, and so I just wanted to introduce another library, yet another library that's. It's sort of like Boost Python, but it does things in more lightweight fashion. Um, so it allows you to interact with Python interpreter or embed Python interpreter in C++ code. So it's header only, um, no dependencies, doesn't require any build tools. It has, it's very small, it's like 5,000 lines uh, core code base. Um, it's optimized for binary size, compile time. So we've seen um, one of the big projects converted from Boost Python to PyBind. Uh, went down by a factor of five in both uh, binary size and compile time, so that was quite big. Um, we support GC, CLang, Visual, Visual Studio, Intel Compiler, Linux, Windows, Mac OS, C Python 2.3, 2, and PyPy. And yes, I said, I really said PyPy. Um, it, we require C11, but some new features from C14 and C17 are also supported. Um, there is support for NumPy without having to actually locate and include uh, NumPy headers. There's support for embedding the interpreter and there's a whole bunch of different functions uh, and like features of C++ that we support. And here's a link to the, uh, to the GitHub repo. So I'll just try to walk, to walk you through that uh, using a few examples. There's not enough time to, to cover all of it, um, but I hope you'll have a good understanding of on how it works. So we'll start with a simple hello world example. That's what you normally do when you learn like a new language or framework. And uh, if you have prerequisites, you, you need like a C Python or, or modern PyPy, and you have, need PyBind 11 package installed, and some non-ancient compiler. And um, in all in all code examples, I will uh, skip this this like three lines. So it's basically including the PyBind header, then aliasing it to the, the namespace to just Py, and also defining the PyBind module, which is like the main extension module. Uh, Okay, so whenever there's a variable m, it just means the module that you're currently defining. All right, so let's write a function that adds two integers, like in C or C++. So here we have a function add that takes a b, returns a, a plus b, and we can call the def on um, def uh, method on the module and tell it, hey, here's the function called add, uh, give it a pointer to the function, and we can give it a doc string and a whole bunch of other things, so it knows how to generate Python signature. That's pretty much it. You compile it, it works. Um, you, don't, you don't have to tell it what, you know, what, what's the exact signature is. It's all inferred from, from the type. So it's using the C++, like the modern C++ um, like type inference features. Um, or you can even write it like this. You don't have to define any functions at all. You can just use a lambda, um, a C++ lambda. So you just tell it here's an anonymous function, takes A and B, returns A plus B. And this also works. Um, so it's like a one-liner, basically. Um, if you compile it, and we'll get that in a second, um, it just works like a normal Python model. In fact, it generates the doc strings and the signatures. So you see there's two int arguments, returns an int. You know, you give it one, one and two, you get three back. Um, if you give it some non-integers, it tells you that the signature is not compatible, so it does the type checking. 
Um, so how do you how do you compile it? Well, there's a few ways. If you're if you're a happy owner of a Linux box, then you can just you know tell it where the includers are, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you don't have to link it to Python or or anything. Um, so that's literally the entire line to compile it. You can do the same thing on macOS. You just have to add like one more flag uh, so it doesn't complain. On Windows, I heard it's possible, but I haven't tried. Um, and it's probably not fun. Um, however, there's there's better ways. So you can actually integrate it in setup tools and distro tools. Just tell it how to how to find pipeline headers, and that's pretty much it. Um, uh, and you have to tell it that you have to compile it in C++ in uh, C++ 11 or 14 mode. That's it. Then setup tools will take it from there. There's another thing. So I've actually built it f specifically for a, this tool specifically for doing this conference and uh, just for myself, but it turned out to be pretty useful. So that's a Jupyter Notebook extension that you can just load in uh, Jupyter Notebook. And it does all the bootstrapping and it will compile your model and actually cache it. It will enable C++ syntax highlighting in the Jupyter. It will forward input output streams from C++. And that's literally the entire cell for, for this. Uh, you, you hit enter, it compiles it, it imports it back, and you can just use your functions from it. Um, so this one is not released on PyPy yet, but I hope to do it this weekend so you can find it on GitHub. Um, finally, if you use CMake, it's just a one line that we, we provide a CMake interface as well. So you say just uh, create a module, my add with these sources, and that's, that's it. All right, so how do we go about wrapping classes? Because that's what C++ is supposedly all about. And um, so let's create simple bindings uh, for an HTTP class, response class in Python. And this is um, this is sort of something like you would get from requests uh, library in Python, like it's a status and reason and text. So for example, in this class, you can create it with just status and reason, or you can also pass the optional text. Uh, which defaults to empty string, or there is a default constructor which just initializes it with 200 and OK, which is the browser response for everything went fine. So this is, this is quite simple, and we want to mirror this like one-to-one -one in Python, so we have the same API. So first of all, we bind the type itself. So we tell PyBind, hey, here's a type response, please create a type called response, a string. Uh, because there's no reflection in C++, we, we have to give it the name like this, a string. Um, so this it registers the type, and you, after this line, you can use it anywhere in any function signatures. You can return it, you can take it as an argument, uh, you can nest it within other types. So um, let's bind the constructors. So in Python, in C++, you can have multiple constructors with different signatures, different overloads. In Python, you have only one init. So what we do here is, um, this is a shortcut for, like the pi in it is a shortcut. Um, it's a template to which you give the signature, the input arguments to your overload, and then it creates this overload in Python. So in fact, in Python, all these three constructors will be merged into one in it, and it will, be, it will do a runtime dispatch. So obviously, a static dis dispatch is not possible because Python is not compiled, but it will, it will look like one function, and in the doc string, it would say that it has three different signatures. Okay. Uh, the attributes, you can, you can bind the attributes directly and to here, and what it does, it creates descriptors in, on the Python side, they could be read-only, like get descriptors or get set, uh, so read-write descriptors. So we can bind this d directly as well. And in C++ we have stud string and int, and in Python you will have like str type, uh, like Unicode type or a int as well. You can, if you have a, a property, so as in, in, in C++, a method that doesn't take any arguments. So like here, for example, it's OK property that tells it if your st status is not an error. You can bind it as a property in Python uh, read-only, or you can actually bind read-write properties as well uh, with a getter and setter. And uh, you can overload operators. So like in C++, there's an equals operator that checks that all the fields are the same. You can do exactly the same thing in Python. So you define the double under a Q takes a self and the other and returns you know, self equals other. And because it's, it's such a common pattern, um, there's actually a shortcut, so you can just uh, include this pybind operators header and say def by self equals self, where this equals could be any operator. It could be like left shift uh, equals or any, any, anything like that. Um, this makes it very, yeah, this makes it very easy to, to bind objects that have, may have like 20 different operators, like a matrix or vector type or something like that. 
Uh, you can define any method. Like, so here we can define a wrapper, so this a type has a proper representation. And you, you do it like you would do in Python, so we just create a string and format it, return it back. Okay, and this is, this is the full binding code. And um, it's, it's not so much, really, so it's comparable to, it's less than the initial implementation. And if, if you were to do this in Cython, it would be kind of the same, and maybe more because Cython doesn't have like, proper overloads. Um, and you can use it like, like any normal uh, you know, Python class, really. So if you import the type, you have your properties, you have your attributes, uh, you, you have doc strings for everything. Um, so so the, you know, the operator, the equality operator works, so it all works as is ex expected. Um, now a few other things on f function signatures. So in Python you can have all these like args and default values, star args, keyword arguments. Um, so it's all, it's all doable here as well. So first of all you can name arguments through pi arg uh, because C++ doesn't have proper reflection. Um, you, you need to give it names. You don't have to, but if you want your, your argument to be called name, like name in this case, you have to tell it that. And now if you look at the doc string, there's actually, it's actually called name. So that, that's nice. Um, you can assign to pi arg, so here we have the same function, but it runs like n times, where times is like an optional argument and defaults to one. And this would, this would work as expected. Then you can call this function with one argument or two, or provide it as a keyword argument. And you can do other things, like you can take any Python object's arguments, you can take a pi list, uh, which is like wrapper about around pi object. And you can, so here for example, we count all the strings in the list, and if you were to do this in Python, it would literally look the same, like line to line. So you do like for item in list, if is instance string item, increase n, then return n back. So that lo looks very close, and it works as, as expected. Uh, you can take star args and keyword arguments as well through like pi args and pi kw args. Um, so as I've already said, there's function, you can bind multiple uh, C++ functions to a single Python name and then they would work as uh, overloads. So it will do runtime dispatch on, on the types. So here we have a function that takes an int or float and you can pass an int or you can pass a float and it goes, it gets dispatched to different functions and if you give it something else, it uh, tells you it's an error. So that's, that's pretty handy. Uh, there, there's a bunch of other things that um, I would just like to quickly jump through. Um, so there's a, three ways to communicate objects between C++ and Python. So the first one is you have a, you create a, something in C++, you wrap it in Py object, um, and then send it off to Python. And you, you just sort of store the pointer inside Py object, and then we record it in um, like registered instance map. So if it, if it ever comes back to C++, we know that we were the ones who created it, we quickly unwrap it, and it's, it's very fast. Um, another one is the opposite, where it's native in Python, but it's a wrapper in C++, so it's like PyList, PyDict, uh, PyInt, PyString, and it's on C++ side, we have a thin wrapper around PyObject, that way around. And the third one is, um, like in the, in the examples that I've just shown, uh, so what you have stud string in C++ and str in Python. Now th these, even in int really, because in Python int is an object as well, um, they have different memory layouts so you can't really, you can't really share them. Uh, so th this would always involve a copy. But there's a ways to, uh, to tell it, to, to work around that if you need to share a, a vector or a map, for example. So some of the types that we support that, that have like built-in uh, converters are like scalars, strings, tuple, sequences, maps, dicts, sets, Polymorphic functions, like daytime functions. Uh, the newer types from C++14, C++17, like std optional, std variant. Um, um, you can also write your own type casters. It's fairly easy, so you can write um, a, for example, like a timestamp type that would work as an int in C++, but once you send it to Python, it works as pandas timestamp, for example. Um, so that could, be, that could be quite handy. Uh, a few more things on classes. Um, I will not go into this in detail because it will involve you know, quite a lot of um, code, but you can do single multiple inheritance. You can override C++ virtual methods from Python and it would work, um, which requires like a middleware class to do that. You can have custom constructors, so um, it's n you're not limited to this pi and h shortcut. You can, you can do anything there, just like in Python. Uh, you can define implicit conversions, so um, if the types are convertible implicitly to each other in C++, you can make it so in Python it works the same way. So the function that expects um, 
a instance of one type can also take another. Okay. You can overload operators and you can also define static methods, properties, attributes and all of that. So there's also the Python interface, so it's like everything that starts with, you know, pi double colon like a pi list or, or pi dict. Uh, and, and we try to wrap quite quite a lot of it. So it starts with an pi object, which is the highest level um, uh, object in the hierarchy, and pi handle, so it could be with or without ref counting. There's all built-in types like pi module and function and list and int. Um, you can cast things back and forth from C++ and Python using this cast operator or cast method. Um, you can call Python functions through just using uh, parentheses normally, and I think this is a pretty cool example where we have a tuple of args, and then we have two dicts of um, two dicts, and, and a function called like engage. And then we call that and we expand um, both tuple and two dicts, and we actually pass one other keyword argument, exactly like you would do in Python, sort of. And this is, you know, this is still C++, it's just heavily overloaded. Um, it looks pretty cool, I think. Um, you can import modules, you can there's a bunch of built-ins that have been wraps like uh, print and format and uh, length is instance and all of that. You can run arbitrary Python code as a string if you want to do that. In fact, we'll have to resort to doing that uh, on PyPy to make a few things um, compatible because, um, you know, if they don't have an equivalent for, for some uh, C Python call, we have to do that. You can run, you can evaluate Python files uh, as well. Uh, one of the big parts, um, is support for buffer protocol in Python, so you can um, so, so you can interact with numeric code. So you can wrap any type, any of custom types, um, to support uh, the buffer protocol, and then you can then, for example, NumPy would automatically pick it up. Uh, like you can just pass it into a NumPy array constructor, and it will know what to do. Um, you can build buffers and mem reviews directly. We also support NumPy. So if you have NumPy installed. You have to include a like PyBind NumPy header, but you don't have to go and start like locating NumPy itself. So we'll figure it out. And there's there's a few types like PyArray, uh, which is untyped array, and PyArrayT, which is a template around um, for a typed array. Um, there's things like there's a lot of functionality, but the few things I'll mention was like it would be bounds checked and bounds unchecked element access, and um, you have fast access to, to array properties like. Uh, uh, shape, number, dimensions, uh, D-type, all of that that we do through NumPy C API. Um, there's support for registering structured NumPy D-types, and if you've never heard what that is, it's kind of like pandas, but in NumPy, like pandas data frames, but in NumPy. Um, and that was my own contribution to PyBind. Um, there's automatic function vectorization and broadcasting, so you can write scalar functions and then just wrap them so they work on any NumPy arrays of any shapes, and that's pretty handy. Uh, we also support Eigen, if you know what that is. That's the, um, it's a numeric C++ library that's uh, quite popular in some, some scientific circles. Um, and a few other things that don't fit anywhere else, and uh, like different return value policies, so you can tell, so for example, if, if you're returning a reference or a pointer, you can tell PyBind that it's actually pointer to an internal member, so it knows how to create weak references and garbage collected. Um, you can tell, you can also tell Py, ask PyBind to keep one object alive while another is alive. So like if you're iterating over a C++ container and you don't want it to die well, you know, before you're done. So that kind of thing. Um, there's automatic translation of uh, C++ exceptions to Python exceptions. You can also register your own translators, sort of like you can do in Boost Python. Uh, you can have custom holder types and we support the default uh, smart pointers like unique pointer and shared pointer. And one last thing I wanted to mention here, it, uh, would be that uh, PyBind does have a runtime of sorts, but it's it's pretty fast. So uh, the way it works, it has a capsule, so that's like a C Python term for a block of shared memory, like within the interpreter. So when you import a Py PyBind module, it looks for an existing capsule, PyBind capsule, and if it doesn't exist, it creates one. And then as you import other PyBind modules, they look for the same capsule and then sort of find it, and they share the same map of registered types and registered instances. So that, that's kind of how it works. Um, and the last two, two sections, uh, I, I, w I wanted to be like, show a few examples of what you can do, what's possible with this. And one is on callback. So how do you, that's quite quite common thing to do. So you have, for example, you have a w fast WebSockets library in uh, C++. 
and it takes um, like on on events you can you know you can pass it a polymorphic function that would be called each time ms arrives for example and how do you wrap this in python um, um, well the, the answer is you can use the polymorphic function type the std function in c++ and it will be converted back and forth to to a Py python function object and this is quite cool because python Python function may be actually closure that, that has a scope captured and C++ function can be a closure that has other C++ stuff captured as well. And it, it works nicely together. So for example, here we have a function uh, for even, so you give it an n, an integer, and you give it a function that takes an int, returns nothing, that would be called for each even number, you know, from zero up to n. And you can use it like so, so you have like a Python callback. So if you compile that, you have a Python callback that just prints a number and you just pass that directly in, and that seems to work. Um, you can also do the, this kind of stuff. You can have a higher order function. So you can make uh, use of capturing closures in C++. So for example, here's a, so int of n is a type, is a function that takes an int, returns an int. So apply n is a function that takes a function, and also a number n, and applies this function n times. Although it does it lazily, so it, it returns you a function that does that if that makes sense. So it's kind of like a decorator of sorts in Python. Um, so like if f is, uh, you know, multiplied by two and n is equal to 10, it will be like multiplied by uh, 1024. Okay, and you can note that in the square brackets we have like f and n. So this is a C++ 11 notation for we capture f and we capture n by value. So this is stored in the, uh, in the closure. And that's pretty much it. Like you can, uh, if you compile this, uh, we can define a py Python function and then pass it there. What's returned back to us is a C++ closure, which is converted to a Python function that we can call, and it, it still works like like a decorator. You can actually go one step further. So, uh, so the green one, the the green apply n is the one from the previous example, and the blue one is a factor that creates the green one from f for a given n. So. It's like if you if you give me n, I will give you a decorator that decorates all these functions in such way, if that makes sense. <laughs> and you can, and just for the fun for the fun of it, we can bind it under the same name because we have overloads in C++. So we have two different versions of apply n. One takes an int, and is like a factory function, and another one takes an int and a function, and returns a function. And we can use them both at the same time. So. So this is the first example where we have a function. We say apply n of f and 8 uh, of 10, and that gives us 2560. Or we can use it as decorator. So we say, you know, at apply n of 8. So that's a factory returns as a decorator. We decorate a function, and it works the same way as well. So I think that's that's pretty cool. That's quite a, quite a lot of machinery going on here, and I'm quite baffled myself that it actually works. Um, and Last but not least, there's um, like num NumPy support is uh, was very important for myself, and um, as I talked to Wenzel, the um, author, uh, I talked to Wenzel, the author of uh, original author of PyBind, just a few days back, he said that this this talk is not hipster enough if there's no you know, pandas and data frames in NumPy. So I figured I should should provide one example. Um, so here's the full example. It took me maybe 10 or 15 minutes to to cook it up. Um, here we we want to compute rolling stats on on a data frame or like no on a series basically of floats. Um, so you have a rolling window that if you if you don't know what that is, uh, you have a fixed window size that just moves along through the series, and every time it moves, it shifts moves by one element. You recompute some statistic like mean or or median or variance standard deviation. So here we'll just compute mean and standard deviation. So th and the type would be double, right? So we have this rolling stats function. It takes a pi array t of double. So it's a it would be like a float 64 uh, numpy array, and it takes a window. And what we do next, we just uh, well we use a to make it faster. We don't actually recompute it uh, each time the buffer buffer moves, we don't recompute it in full. Uh, we can make use of the fact that uh, to compute the mean, you know, every, every time you can, if you have the sum of elements in the buffer and, and you have sum of squares, then you can infer actually both the mean and the standard deviation. 
And to keep track of the sum and the sum of squares, you can just add one element and subtract one, one element at a time each time you move through the buffer. And it makes it a lot faster than actually trying to reevaluate the whole thing every time. I'm not entirely sure what Pandas does in, uh, so I haven't looked in this rolling API, but um, it's, it's, it's a little bit slower. And so as you can see from the code, it's, it's not overly involved, um, and it's, you know, uh, it uses this unchecked um, proxy access to NumPy race, so we disable the bounds checking, because we know we're not gonna, you know, run over outside the bounds. Um, the rest is just like normal numeric code, where there were some computations uh, stored in the stats array. One thing to note is that stats is a struct here, and we, what we return back from this function is a pi array of this, of a structured type. Uh, so this is known as the record array in NumPy or structured array. And in our module, we have to register it explicitly. So we say, hey, here's the stats type. It has um, stats NumPy D type, and it has two columns, mean and STD. And they will be translated uh, with, to Python with these names. And then we just bind the function. So, so the way this works, uh, if we compile this and try it out, um, we can pass um, we can pass anything convertible to an NumPy array, really, to this function. So this rolling stats, we so here I pass a bunch of ints and window of two, and you get back a data frame that looks like this. Um, so obviously this is the running mean, this is the running standard deviation. Um, so if you were to use the pandas rolling dot mean or rolling dot std, you would get the same result. In fact. Let's check it, uh, let's just generate 25 million values and do it both ways, and yeah, we can check it that it's the same. And we can also check if it's fast enough. So if you run this in pandas for 25 million elements with window size of 1,000, it takes 1.1 seconds for to compute the mean, and it takes another 1.18 to compute the standard deviation. In our case, it takes 0 0.26 seconds to, to compute both. So it actually does make sense, like, and if, you know, if it, if it starts taking minutes or sometimes hours to compute this kind of things, if you have a lot of data, so it may be worthwhile to spend, you know, 10 minutes and code it up yourself. And uh, finally, I'd like to say thanks to, to Wenzel Jacob, who's the, the original author of this project, and Jason and Dean, who are currently maintaining it and handling all the issues, adding a lot of features, and a lot of people, including myself, for contrib contributing all the other stuff. Also, Dave Abrahams for creating Boost Python and Boost MPL. And I'd like to thank my work um, employer, uh, Saskana, for letting me hack on this at work, uh, at work time. And last but not least, uh, I'd like to thank you for listening. Thanks. Okay, we have uh, some time for questions if there are any. Hi, thank for your talk. Um, could I uh, pickle class? Yeah, there's pickling support as well. Ah, thank I you. Just, I just didn't mention all the features because it would take too long. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes. Hi, thanks for the talk. It looks great. Um, I'm just wondering if you can, um, if you're always using the heap for allocation or if you can do any fancy allocation, say placement, or if you're dealing with an array. Are you uh, always allocating objects in the heap, or can you do different uh, forms of all allocation? Um, so the heap allocation for what exactly? Um, so say, for example, when you declare a, um, a class and you have, the, you have the example of multiple init um, types, signatures, um, when you actually instantiate that object in Python, yeah. is it always happening on the heap, or can you do anything different? E yeah, it currently happens on the heap, so it uses the, the new operator in, in C++. But I think, do you mean like the new Python malloc, uh, py malloc API? Um, so we don't, we don't explicitly support that, but it should be possible. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the library looks really, really cool. I'm wondering what the state of documentation examples and what's the license of the library? Um, the documentation is pretty good. Uh, it's, it's been, it's pretty well maintained, I would say. It explains a lot more than uh, than this talk, and it walks you through the examples from you know from really simple ones to the 
most complicated ones. So it's, uh, what we're also planning to do is, is um, set up a tutorial notebooks that will, so you can run the whole thing in uh, trip to notebook as well. But uh, the documentation is hosted on read the docs, and so you can find it on our GitHub repo. We also, uh, one thing to note is that um, there's a few things in this talk, there's a few synt um, syntax uh, differences in this talk um, from the latest stable release. So it's actually, if you try to com compile this with the, uh, whatever is on PyPy right now, it may complain, but we'll push a version uh, fairly soon that will, you know, be compatible with this. And what's the license of the library? Hmm? The license, is it GPL, is it MIT, is it? I think it's MIT. <laughs> you mentioned that the problems with Boost Python are the long compile times and the, the generated ob ob shared object size. So do you have any numbers on, on how PyBind compares to that? Um, I'm sorry, numbers comp on what exactly? So the, the compile times? Compile times. Yeah. And the generated code size. Yeah, so um, the thing is, if you, if, if you have a really small module, then uh, boost, the, the, the extension model generated with Boost Python would be smaller because Boost Python has a compiled part, like a pre-compiled part, right? So PyBind Py model would, would actually be bigger than both Scythe and Boost Python if you have like a two-liner. Once it starts going up, um, so as I said, we have an example of, it's, it's a Py Rosetta um, uh, uh, wrapper for a chemical framework. Uh, that was initially written in, in Boost Python, and then they, the developers tried to convert it to PyBind, which they did successfully. And I think it went down by a factor of like 5.8 uh, and 5.7 or something like this, both compile time and the binary size. And uh, in my experience as well, so if I don't personally use Boost Python, but I did some benchmarks just to see, just to see that it's true. Uh, so I assume the global interpreter lock is held when uh, C++ code is called when, uh, from Python, and uh, can I drop the gale? Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I skipped it here just for the sake of time. But you can, there's things like sc scoped, y you, can, you can have like a scoped guards for gale release, for example. Yeah, that's all there as well. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, thanks again. Thanks a lot.